college football is about to go to the next level because this week in Tuscaloosa, we've got Georgia coming to town to play Alabama. And for the first time since 2007, Alabama is a home underdog. Yeah, that's right. Georgia, two-point favorites over Alabama on their home turf. This is actually the first time since 2015 that Alabama has been a regular season underdog, period. And this is a Georgia team that just escaped a couple of weeks ago by the skin of their teeth in Lexington, Kentucky. And I'm from Kentucky, and I know very well I could count the number of competitive games we've had with Georgia in my lifetime on one hand, probably. So that's not a great omen, but still they're favored over Kalen DeBoer and the Alabama Crimson Tide. No Nick Saban. That's taken me a little while to get used to. Nick Saban has left the building. Kalen DeBoer is in the building. Nick Saban wasn't the most exciting guy. The most exciting thing that Nick Saban did was win relentlessly. And that's the kind of excitement that fans like the most. We got Deion Sanders out in Colorado. He creates a lot of off-the-field excitement. That remains to be seen if it's going to translate to on-field success. I don't know that we always need exciting coaches. Maybe there can be a little too much excitement. I heard someone call him Kalen DeBoring. But maybe boring is good. Let's take a look at what the new coach of the Alabama Crimson Tide, Kalen DeBoer, had to say about this weekend's showdown with the Georgia Bulldogs. Yeah, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of uh, celebrity-type people here. Um people that want to come be a part of uh you know what's what's happening on uh on game day it's going to be a um you know everyone's watching and so uh you know uh be great to have have everyone who wants to come watch be here and uh um you know for us I told the guys this with game day and everything uh coming here as well uh for for the guys to try to take as much off of their plate uh other than maybe a few extra interviews uh Towards the end of the week, uh, you know, just the main thing is that they get prepared to play the best football game that they've played this year. Or, you know, I always challenge them to play the best football game they've ever played in their career. And so uh, that's what matters uh, when it comes down to what we can control. And uh, but, yeah, it is kind of cool that uh, we have a lot of people who want to come be a part of the atmosphere and and uh, add to the excitement energy that the, the game will bring. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Excuse me. What did he say? Kirby Smart had some comments too, and they were also not riveting. They're not worth mentioning here because I can't remember what the fuck Kirby Smart said. But maybe that's the point. Don't give the other team bulletin board material and don't create off the field distractions. Maybe that is the recipe for success in not only college football, but every sport. There is going to be some off-the-field excitement, however, because President Donald Trump is going to be in the his house in Tuscaloosa for this one. And what's it been, about five years ago that uh, Trump made an appearance at a game, and got a rousing standing ovation. Seems longer than that, before COVID. And there he is. But I remember how that place roared for him there. It'll probably happen again. He's in the heart of uh, red state America in Alabama, so I would expect that he'll he'll get a uh, warm reception. But uh, let me bring in a man who's never boring. I'm speaking, of course, of the international streaming star. He is my sidekick, Ronnie T-Shirts, live and in living color from Nashville, Tennessee. 
Ronnie, boring coaches. What do you think? Would you rather the guy that you've got on the sideline have a little vim and vigor, or would you rather it be a guy like Kalen DeBoer, who is uh, basically not sending a tingle up anybody's leg, but presumably is getting down to football business? I want my coach to be boring. I mean, Ryan Day is pretty boring. He doesn't when he's asked questions, he just gives old standard. We need to, we need to execute and do what we're supposed to do and do all that stuff. But yeah, I want other coaches. I get amused by other coaches. I mean, Gundy is by no stretch of the imagination, uh, boring. And I don't know the last time Oklahoma state was in a conversation about national championships. So I really prefer my coach to be boring um, obviously you want them to have personality, uh, cause you want them to attract, you know, kids who want to play there and, and things like that. But I think when we're talking about boring is I think we're talking about, don't say anything controversial because we have, there, there's, a, there's a long list of, of athletes that, that feed off of, uh, other people saying things controversial about them or their team. I mean, you can go Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods, uh, and it translates into team sports too. Like why give anybody bulletin board material? It just, it doesn't make any sense. So I'll take my coach boring. Well, speaking of uh, bulletin board material, you know, the great Jared, our PA is a uh, proud Penn state Nittany lion. And they've got a uh, showdown coming up with the, uh, the pride of champagne Urbana, the, Illinois fighting Illini and their coach, uh, Brett Belima, giving a little bit of bulletin board material to Penn State. Let's take a look at that. I don't, you know, I don't know if they're going to be in blue and white or whatever they're going to be in this weekend. They're going to be dressed right, and it's going to, it's probably going to be one or the other. Um, I know they're calling for a white, uh, white out energy, whatever the hell that means. White out energy, whatever the hell that means. That seems like such an innocuous statement but it's probably going to amplify the decibel level in Happy Valley by a pretty reasonable factor. Would you not think? Because it's these little comments. Seems innocuous. Why would you say that if you're him? What do you have to profit, Ron? Well, to be fair, Penn State thinks that they own the color white. So I don't necessarily disagree with them. So, Well, look at you giving Penn State bulletin board material now. You better hope yeah. Jerry Sandusky doesn't come and pay you a visit. <laughs> You've been waiting six I'm weeks. I'm sorry, to... <laughs> Jared. I'm sorry, Jared. I've been, I made my Hulk Hogan NWO heel turn on Jared there. <laughs> I've been holding in Jerry Sandusky comments for the entire duration of this show. I couldn't make it any, I couldn't make it any longer. Uh, I just saw Jared's message come up. That was cold. I'm sorry, Jared. Hey, it ain't the first time or the last time you're going to hear that one, buddy. What can I what can I tell you? Well, I don't know what you have to gain by it, but you know, look, some coaches like to talk. Woody Hayes had a pretty big mouth, and I would say you're probably a pretty big fan of him. I don't think that Woody Hayes had a big mouth. I don't really say he didn't really say anything inflammatory about other teams. Now, I mean, he was known to punch players from other teams, uh, Charlie Bauman, to be specific, in the 1978 Gator Bowl that eventually ended his career, and he would attack, you know, sideline refs that hold the uh, the the sticks, but he didn't really, he wasn't, I don't ever remember him mouthing off that much, but then again, Woody Hayes well, wasn't in an era where, where, where they, there was a lot of sound bites. Ron, they asked him one time why he went for two on Michigan while you guys were up over 30 points. And he, he told the media three. because he couldn't go for, <laughs> couldn't three. Go for three. But that was after the game. Which is, well, you don't think they remembered it next year? Yeah. yeah. No. Come on. That's, oh, you're, a, you're an Ohio State homer. It's ridiculous. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's talk about the poll of the day over at Super 70 Sports on X, where I try not to be boring, boring coaches good, boring tweeters bad. 
I think is probably the the truth that I live by. So uh, the poll of the day brought to you by, we don't have a sponsor yet, but it would be great if one day we did. Um, the options, Ron, and I feel like I got a little creative here today. I think this might be my strongest poll in a while. I'm going to be honest with you. I have aspirations that I could get between 20 and 30% on all four of these. Those aspirations are probably going to go down the shitter moments from now when producer Tim clicks on his vote. But I've got Apple Jacks, one of the, uh, one of the finer breakfast cereals, in my opinion. It's, it holds up. Kids like it. Adults like it. It's, it's sugary, but it's not overly sugary, in my opinion. You've got Gordon Lightfoot, the Canadian troubadour, Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, Sundown, If You Could Read My Mind, one of the saddest, most poignant love songs ever written. You've got bookstores. I love a good bookstore, Ron, I have to tell you. And I I got creative here with the last one. I don't know what to expect, but downing a punt at the five, the satisfaction of Somebody preventing that pump from going in the end zone and pinning your opponent deep in their own territory, Ron. So break it down for me, buddy. Well, if you would have put on their Apple Jacks dust, I probably would have voted for it because there's nothing better than when you finish that that box of Apple Jacks and then down in one of the corners, all that cinnamony, sugary, apple-y dust has accumulated and you can just lick your finger and just kind of put it down. Oh, so snort good. it. Just do oh. lines of it. I would do oh. lines of Applejack dust on. Yeah, I really uh, would. I'm not proud of it, but I would uh, again, Gordon Lightfoot. Don't dislike him. He's fine, but I wouldn't pick that bookstores. I it's funny. I don't read anymore, but I do love bookstores. I actually used to collect um, sports biographies and I'd have a whole, I'd have, I had two full shelves of sports biographies and I'd always get the ones I'd always get them on clearance because, you know, they'd have the kind of clearance section. And that was a, that was a good place to find sports biographies. Uh, I would argue that downing a punt on the three would be better than the five. But, well, I didn't uh, want to make it too good. Uh, I, Producer I Tim's picked, just moving in. He's giving you like the Oscar, I pick, like walk I pick off the stores. stage music here. I pick bookstores. All right. Bookstores for me also. And Gordon, look at Gordon Lightfoot. Holy shit. Holy shit. I, look, I'm not complaining. Gordon Lightfoot is great. I actually kind of love to see it, to be honest with you, Ron. But Gordon Lightfoot almost doubling up Applejack. Downing a punt Applejacks. is number two. Downing a punt is number two yeah. by a lot. Tells you a lot about our country. Fuck books. Let's pin somebody deep and see what they can do. <laughs> field position. Field position over literacy. There's nothing more American than that. Cue up some John Mellencamp pink houses in the background because that's about as uh, American as it gets. Uh, I'm disappointed to see Apple Jacks. I mean, I wasn't that far off, Ron. This was a pretty good one. Gordon Lightfoot just exceeding expectations here. We'll have to see with almost 5,000 votes cast, Ron. I don't know if he's going to be able to maintain that pace. Obviously, the Canadians are chiming in early here, but I, uh, I'm, I'm surprised but sort of gratified to see Gordon Lightfoot out in first place. We might see him on Championship Friday, Ronnie. Oh, I, well, I think that's that's a given at this point. I'm wondering if maybe Cinnamon Toast Crunch instead of Apple Jacks would have uh, lifted that serial number up a little bit. But we'll never know. Yeah, we'll never know. Uh, well, one thing that we will know is what the fuck I'm tweeting because let's take a look at that. I do like to, I do like to tweet. Well, really, some days it's more of an obligation. I'm going to be honest with you. It started out as a labor of love, and now it's just a monster that I've created that I must feed every day, but I do enjoy it the vast majority of the time. So what have we, what have we curated today for our outkick audience? Oh boy. 
man, here's one. And I'm of two minds about this one. One, this tweet's going to do really well. I know that it's going to get a shit ton of retweets and likes, so that's good. The bad part is, is I'm getting old and I'm probably going to die soon. Look at this. Nirvana released Nevermind, an album that changed music, absolutely changed the entire musical landscape. I think of every song that I've heard released probably in my lifetime, Nevermind is the one that I would say most changed the dynamic of pop culture. Because I like 80s music, but if we're being honest with ourselves, by the late 80s, it was getting a little off track. When you say 80s music, to me, 70s music, you could be talking about 1970, or you could even go into the Bee Gees disco era. Some people are going to disagree with me on that. But I think the whole decade holds up. The 80s starts to leak a little oil when you get up around 88, 89, into 90. And then in September of 1991, these three grungy motherfuckers from Seattle show up and release a song, this album, but we all remember Smells Like Teen Spirit. And that song changed the entire arc of popular culture. Pretty soon everybody was wearing flannel, and we we went completely into alternative music. But 33 years, if you can imagine. Nevermind is closer in the continuum of time to 1959. It's closer to Dwight D. Eisenhower's presidency than today. Chew on that one and then go have a adults over 50 multivitamin later today and schedule your colonoscopy, you old motherfucker. I'm going to bring in now a man who is a little bit Younger than myself. I'm going to have to find out how old this this young kid was. If, in fact, he was even born when this album came out. I'm speaking of OutKick senior college football writer and friend of the Ricky Cobb Show. The great Trey Wallace joins the program. Trey, you're a young dude. I'm getting to that age where, like, everybody younger than me, I can't even guess their age anymore. How old are you, buddy? You really want that? How old are you, Ricky? You really want me to throw that out I'm, there? <laughs> I'm, fi- I'm 50, th- I'm 53 years young, Trey. No, you're good, man. I'm 38. So, um, okay. I, have, I, 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 I know that look, man, I know the album. I used to, I used to rock out. Now, look, it was a little bit before, you know, I hit the age where I could pull up the CD player. Um, uh, but still that's when you go back and you listen to the good stuff, right? <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I've got an 18-year-old daughter that that loves Nirvana. You know, it's good music is just good music, but yeah, that doesn't make me feel any doesn't make me feel any younger to know that you were on your way to fucking kindergarten with Smells Like Teen Spirit dropped. Yeah, I'm on my way to the old folks home. I'm if telling I was, you. Uh, um, if I was if I was feeling down Ricky, about anything, you just pop on the Nirvana thing and you sit in your bedroom and you just kind of, you know, grunge out. So it's what it is, right? Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. Uh, Trey, what do you think on the topic of boring coaches? Kalen DeBoer, a little boring, but maybe that's just what the doctor ordered. I mean, you've interviewed more coaches probably than you could even be- begin to count. Uh You've seen the colorful, you've seen the quotable, you've seen the guys that are the opposite of that. What's your ideal coaching temperament if you were going to bring somebody in to head up your program? Yeah, I mean, if I'm being honest, I I would love to be, if I was covering a team like on a daily basis, Ricky, I would love for it to be somebody like Lane Kiffin, uh, who is like, you know, throwing subtle shots at opposing teams uh, while he's giving a heartfelt message about his quarterback and the relationship. Um, Kirby Smart, man, he, that guy's just right down the middle. Kalen DeBoer, I think, has kind of changed his tune a little bit compared to when he was at Washington because I I interviewed Kalen DeBoer 
uh, when they were playing for a national championship um, uh, you know, against Michigan. And, you know, it wasn't, I don't, I don't want to say like he, it completely changed Ricky, but he wasn't as maybe stoic uh, as he is right now. And, you, and, and sometimes you have to uh, at Alabama. They tried to get him. It was funny. They tried to get him yesterday with the old Donald Trump question. And my man has been prepped on what to say because he did not mention his name. <laughs> Um, so I, I, I tip my cap to him for saying, yeah, we, there's a lot of people interested in coming to the game this weekend. So he, he has been well-trained when it comes to how to deal with the media, especially in Tuscaloosa, which is very, very interesting and kind of hardcore, uh, just because of the amount of people that are down there covering it on a daily basis. Trey, how wild is the atmosphere going to be in Tuscaloosa is it fair to say this is the biggest football game since the Super Bowl? I, oh man, uh, yeah. I mean, college football wise, yeah. We thought the Texas Michigan game was going to be fun. That was just blow up. But look, this is this is Alabama Georgia. If you if you aren't familiar with it, just go back and look at the history over the last seven to eight years. Uh, the Kirby Smart versus Nick Saban rivalry, uh, and now we have Kirby versus um, Kalen DeBoer. But man, this is going to look. This is going to be batshit crazy in Tuscaloosa on Saturday. Um, and, and I was talking about the colleagues in Oklahoma last weekend. You know, there. If you haven't, I would suggest to fans going to the game leave tomorrow because the security to get into the game on Saturday is going to be absolutely bonkers. You're going to be standing in line for three to four hours. Uh, President Trump, former President Trump, will uh, arrive you know, probably an hour and a half before the game. Uh, he'll, he'll sit up in the press box or a, well, actually in a suite uh, for a few hours, and then they'll get him out of there before the game ends. It just, it's going to be a madhouse. You throw in the pregame shows that are going on in Tuscaloosa, and then you add on to the fact this is a top-five matchup. Um, I, I think you're going to have a tremendous amount of Georgia fans traveling over if they can get through the hurricane that's coming uh, their way. And then you look at it overall – like we're at a point now where we're getting these great games. Like I look ahead to like in, in a couple of weeks, we're going to get Georgia versus Texas, you know, in Austin, like that's going to be wild. But you throw in the fact this thing is in Tuscaloosa and Georgia and Alabama, their history, and they hate each other so much. Uh, Kirby Smart's going to try to stick it to Bama this weekend. If he can, Kalen DeBoer looking for that first big signature win as an Alabama coach. And then you add on that the former president decides he wants to come in for a photo op and be at the game. So it's just, it's going to be very interesting to see how this environment is on Saturday, because I'm expecting just all hell to break loose. Well, I don't think there's any doubt about it. It's, uh, no. it's probably going to live up to the hype. I would, I would imagine, uh, Trey, Reggie Bush, Name, image, likeness, litigation. The winds have shifted, obviously, and Reggie Bush thinks they're at his sales now. He got his Heisman Trophy back, and now the momentum seems to be with him. What do you make of this lawsuit, and what are the potential ramifications for the NCAA here? Yeah, I mean, so... So Reggie got his Heisman back. Reggie is now honored uh, inside the L.A. Coliseum with his jersey um, number that they put up into the stadium. So he got that part back. Uh, now he wants some of the money recouped from, you know, from from USC using his his videos, you know, from the NCAA doing it, from the Pac-12 doing it, what's left of the Pac-12. Um, and now you look at the situation where – a lot of this, I won't get into the weeds on it because it's really hard to understand, but there's a lawsuit that's being settled right now with the NCAA. It's called House versus NCAA. And they're giving back pay to student athletes. But the problem is they're only going back to 2016. Well, Reggie Bush was a star before 2016 at USC. So he's coming for his piece of cake. He wants his money when it comes to NIL and jersey sales. I mean, you guys remember how much the crazy it was with jersey sales and everybody running around with his number um, and, and the amount of times he was shown on television and USC using his apparel and his likeness. So now that this lawsuit 
is being settled. This is just kind of the start. Like I was surprised Johnny Manziel wasn't the first one to really come out and look for, you know, NIL money dating back to the Texas A&M just because of how much money he made the Aggies. But now you got Reggie Bush doing it. And it feels like he he's also got another lawsuit out against the NCAA for pretty much defamation. So you're just adding to it now. So he wants the money. I don't know what a figure is that they could stick on that would make him happy. Um, but at the same time, I look at the situation and I think, okay, like if if this is how we're going to do it, and if this is how we're going to quote unquote repay these athletes for taking their name, image, and likeness from previous years, how far does this go back? How many players do you want to have this? Like, okay, you know, the, the Baker Mayfield, he's going to get his with this lawsuit, but let's go back before, you know, what's going on with Sam Bradford. I could go on and on. So the problem is, is that we're setting we're setting an expectation here for these former players that were stars to come out and get their money, and and so I I don't know, but he's suing everybody and their mother. Uh, and 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 this also comes to the fact that you know my dude was you know he was found guilty of receiving illegal benefits, impermissible benefits while at USC. So like. He was making money while at USC. He was just not doing it the legal route. So I, I find it entertaining uh, that he's going back and looking for some name, image, and likeness money. But hell, Ricky, good for him, man. Go back and get everything and just stick it to the NCAA. Yeah, it really does raise the question of how far how far back can you go? Are there guys from the 90s that are like, hey, well, wait a minute. I, I want to get paid. Where does it end? That's I, that's the thing, right? Where does it end? Herschel Walker might like a little money from what Georgia profited from him, for all I know. And Ricky, I can name off, you know, you can start naming off Georgia running backs or Alabama running backs or Texas players or whatnot. I mean, you, Ohio State players, you could go on and on and on here. So, you know, I, <laughs> I'm very interested, you know, when they made that deadline of 2016 in this settlement that's going to be negotiated in the next couple months and then players will start receiving back pay. But when they made it 2016, all you did was just set yourself up for these former Heisman winners and stars. You know, think, think about Tim Tebow, brother. If Tim Tebow really wanted to come after the NCAA for NIL, my dude could take them for millions and millions of dollars for how much they profited off his name, image, and likeness. So I, I don't think Tim will do something like that, but I'm just saying if he wanted to, he might be able to bankrupt the NCAA. <laughs> well, uh, let's talk about the OutKick Elite Top 12, Trey. Uh, the, the action of this past weekend didn't really shake things up uh, in any real sense. I don't know that we have a lot of movement. Utah moving up, Missouri moving down. What are your thoughts here as we as we move into the new week? Yeah, I'm, I'm very interested to see what the matchup, you know, how we're doing this, you know, what the matchups would be like if the playoff started, you know, today. Um, and, and you would have Texas in there in the top four. In my opinion, you would have Utah in there in the top four. Um, you know, you can, you can throw in Miami and Ohio state as well. Uh, Missouri, you know, Missouri got caught by Vanderbilt, uh, you know, and, and that's why they dropped in my opinion, Missouri is a good football team, but you know, Vanderbilt went into their place and, and, you know, gave them a fight for four quarters and two overtimes. Um, I, I look at, and that's why I dropped them by the way. So, you know, it's, it's not like, you know, they're going to continue dropping, even though the schedule is very easy. Um, you, you look at it right now. I think Utah is a team, once they get Cam Rising back, like back, back, uh, and not trying to throw him out there as a decoy uh, before the game thinking he's going to play, um, Utah is going to be a, a really hard team to beat in the Big 12. Um, you look at Miami and Cam Ward. That is money well spent on Cam Ward uh, transferring. I, I think Florida State folks are, are very, very jealous of what's going on in Miami. So in, in the outkick top 12, I, I, I think – you know, pretty much they got it right. Like I like Boise State sitting there at 12, you know, as the last one in. There were some votes that were very interesting to me, maybe is the right way to put it. I probably could have said something else uh, by a couple of the panelists that were fun to dissect. But, um, you know, overall, uh, this is kind of where I think we're at right now. Uh, and, and, and we're about to, look, there's about to be some separation. 
Um, you are going to get Georgia and Alabama this week. You know, um, you are going to see, you know, I, I personally think Louisville will probably beat Notre Dame this weekend, which is going to completely knock them out of the picture so people can stop voting for them to be in their top 12 because they're not good on offense. Hint, hint, somebody, peep folks out there. Um, and then down the road, you know, we're going to get LSU Ole Miss playing. Um, so I, I'm just saying there's a bunch of good matchups. That, you know, Ohio State-Oregon matchup. Going to be very fun. But I think I think the last thing I'll say about this is it, it does – in these big matchups, if you catch a loss, like this weekend with Alabama and Georgia, if I'm being real honest with you guys, this weekend's game really doesn't mean much because the loser of this game is going to have one loss and they can afford another loss, potentially make the playoffs. So I get that the matchup and the marquee of it, everything is really big, but when it comes to the playoffs, I think they're going to be fine down the road. So that's why I look at you know whoever loses on Saturday night, they're they're still in the playoff hunt. They're only going to drop a couple spots depending on how they lose. But I'm just looking at it overall. We're getting into the meat of the schedule now, and uh, we're about to find out which teams are for real this year. All right. Well, let me bring in real quickly the uh, the international streaming star, resident college football expert, relative to me at I'm least, <laughs> Ron- Ronnie T-shirts. <laughs> Ronnie, uh, <laughs> Ronnie, when Trey comes on the program, I'm I'm morally and ethically obligated uh, to to let you converse with him. So uh, let it rip, buddy. All right, Trey. Brother. We've been talking about all these great teams. Yeah. So let's go the other direction. Can you think of, in recent memory or any memory for that matter, can you think of any team that has been the opposite of what we thought they were going to be at the beginning of the season, like Florida state, that team's horrible. I, I, Ronnie, I look at Florida state and they, so I, I, those comments I made earlier about cam ward, um, they could have had cam ward if they had spent the money, but Miami came on the backside. So they had to, and I'm not, this is not a shot at DJ you, um, but they had to settle for DJ you, uh, at quarterback. And you're kind of seeing, the ramifications of that. The offense is just not good. So looking at Florida State, like this was supposed to be like what? Taylor Swift puts it out there like the redemption tour or whatever they want to call it. This was supposed to be Florida State's redemption tour this year. Can't believe I just do a Taylor Swift, you know, whatever. (laughs) Um, But at the same time, you look at Florida State, they almost lost to Cal this past weekend, you know, uh, and, and I just feel like right now, Florida State is a team that can turn it around. Like, they just need a really good quarterback, and I think they go find one in the portal in the offseason, and they'll be fine moving forward. Um, but even you look at, like a, look at like a Kansas State team, Ronnie, that we thought was going to fight for the playoffs and the Big 12, and then they go get their rear ends kicked at BYU. I think it was 38-9 to nine was the final score. And you're like, wait a minute. This is a team that we thought was going to contend here. And then I'll throw another one at you, Oklahoma State. Oklahoma State, you know, was benching their starting quarterback in the first half against Utah because of just how bad he was playing. And and, and so now you got Oklahoma State that catches a loss to Utah. And I don't in me thinking, well, hell, they got better than the best running backs in the country in Ollie Gordon. Why why are they playing the way they are playing? So, like those two teams, three teams kind of stand out to me as like, whoa, wait a minute. You know, and I think another one out there that I think we might find out a little bit more about is going to be Oregon. I don't know how good Oregon is yet. That Ohio State matchup in Eugene is going to be absolute madness, and I look forward to being there and covering it. Um, I, I think we'll find out a lot about Oregon. I already know, you know, in terms of Ohio State, but you look at it, man. Yeah, there's some disappointments out there, and 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 kind of just throwing one else out there, Ronnie. USC, like going up to Michigan and losing. Come on, man. Michigan doesn't have a damn quarterback. You just you just went up there and lost to a team that could not pass the football. At the same time, you got USC out here trying to run their offense. It was a disaster, and, and now it puts them in a rough spot because of their schedule and the way they play. So I, I just, you know, there, there's a number of disappointing teams out there, and I, and I think I would start with those three. Yeah. I, All right, uh, Trey Wallace. Uh, thank you, buddy. A uh, lot of great stuff. A little birdie told me, by the way, that you're a uh, you're a pro wrestling guy. So I think I'm going to yeah. put at least one pro wrestling question on ice for you for next week. 
We might we might make you the official pro wrestling correspondent of the Ricky Cobb show as well, bud. Let me tell you something. When, let me tell you something, brother. Uh, when when I was growing <laughs> up, it was going to see Hulk Hogan at the Mobile Convention Center uh, in Mobile, Alabama, and going to you know, the WCW shows and and WWF shows back in the day. So look, I grew up on it, man. The Jim Crockett. You know, that that's all me. So I can't wait to talk professional wrestling with you, buddy, next week because I think we're gonna have something to talk about after tomorrow night's documentary is released. I have a feeling that you are right about that, brother. So uh let let's hold that for next week. But yeah, I got a feeling Trey Wallace, a man who is no doubt NWO for life. Hey, Outkick fans on YouTube. If you enjoyed this episode, hit the subscribe button and make your way over to outkick.com where you can watch the full episode.